Like any good scientific endeavor, empirical economics involves the following four steps. First, you need to develop the question or hypothesis. This is the most important step. You can't get a useful answer unless you have a well-posed question. Second, you need to develop the method of using data to answer your question. This usually involves making use of tools from the mathematical field of statistics. Third, you need to find the data required to answer the question. And finally, you need to interpret your findings. Let's take a closer look at each of these steps and economists' best practices for carrying them out, starting with developing the hypothesis. A good testable hypothesis tends to be a positive or factual question rather than a normative or opinion-based question. So a question like, how does cutting taxes affect economic growth, could be a good hypothesis. But the question, should taxes be cut, would not work as well. Similarly, the question, how much does raising the price of an Uber ride impact the number of rides demanded, is positive and testable. It's a great hypothesis. But the question, should the government regulate Uber more, is a normative question that does not work as well as a hypothesis. Now, these other normative questions are important and interesting, and the tools of economics can certainly help us think about them. But they're not testable hypotheses with clearly fact-based answers. Second, we need to think about how to analyze data, often using statistics, to identify and estimate the causal connections in our question. Does cutting taxes cause the economy to grow? Does raising the price of an Uber ride cause the number of rides demanded to decrease? The empirical economist needs some means of establishing causation. How can she be sure the real story is that A causes B and not that B causes A or some other factor C causes both? This is the core question in empirical methodology and we talk about this in the application video. Third, we define the data required to answer the question or generate that data if it doesn't already exist. Historically, economic research relied on time series data looking at how things change over time. The problem with these data is that lots of things change over time and for lots of different reasons. It can be hard to separate causation from correlation. Over the past several decades, there's been a shift to the use of micro data in economic research. This is data on individual people or companies that allow us to more deeply explore the behavioral mechanisms we talked about in earlier lectures. Finally, once we have the hypothesis, the data, and the empirical methodology, we need to interpret our results. It isn't sufficient to simply develop some evidence. You need to figure out what it means and how it applies to the model we've discussed. Let's return to our earlier example of measuring the effect of government benefits on labor supply to see how these four steps might play out in practice. A well-posed hypothesis might be, how does race and the generosity of government benefits impact the amount that people work? What would a convincing empirical methodology look like? Methodologies that simply examine time series data on how the level of government benefits and labor supply change over time are bound to run into the same causation and correlation confusion we talked about earlier. Let's take as an example the Temporary Aid for Needy Families, or TANF, program. This is a program that provides cash assistance to low-income families, many of which are households headed by single mothers. As you can see from this graph, the maximum monthly benefit available through TANF, adjusted for inflation, decreased from over $1,000 a month in 1968 to around $500 in 2010. Over the same period, the average number of hours per year worked by single mothers rose from below 1,100 in 1968 to almost 1,200 in 2010. Government benefits go down and labor supply goes up. What do these time series data tell us about the causal relationship between benefits and labor supply? By themselves, they don't tell us all that much. Think about everything else that was happening over these decades, aside from cuts in government benefits, that may have impacted single mother's work decisions. Over this period, acceptance of women in the workplace was growing, and families had more and better options for childcare. The simple fact that labor supply for single mothers is higher today than it was 40 years ago does not prove that cuts to government benefits cause the increase. We need a strategy that will allow us to separate out causation from correlation. One popular strategy 
for scientists of all stripes, including social scientists such as economists, is to run an experiment. You may have experience with experiments in chemistry or physics, but what does an experiment in economics look like? Well, if we wanted to measure the effect of government benefits on labor supply, we could take a group of people and flip a coin for each one. Heads, and that person gets money from the government. In experimental terms, they are the treatment group. Tails, and that person gets nothing. In experimental terms, they are the control group. Thus, we can measure how much each group decides to work. Any differences between the groups can be attributed to the effect of the government benefit for the treatment group. Why? Because the coin flip took care of all the correlation and causation confusion we discussed earlier. For example, suppose we carried out this experiment and found the treatment group that got higher benefits through a coin flip ended up working less. This shows that the higher benefits caused folks to work less. How do we know that it wasn't that people work less for other reasons and would thus give more government benefits? Because the benefits were decided by a coin flip that had nothing to do with how much the person was working. And how do we know that it wasn't some third factor such as disability that caused both the lower work hours and the government benefits? Because the benefits were decided by a coin flip that had nothing to do with the disability status of the individual. So economic experiments like this are a gold standard but they can be difficult, costly, and at times unethical to implement. It doesn't seem very fair to determine someone's government benefits using a coin flip. However, economics can sometimes find data in the real world that approximate the data that one might get in an experiment. The circumstances that generate these data are sometimes called natural experiments. Suppose, for example, that we have a large sample of single mothers in the neighboring states of Arkansas and Louisiana. Suppose also that in 2008, the state of Arkansas raised the benefits it gave those mothers by 20%, while Louisiana kept its benefits unchanged. In principle, this alteration in Arkansas policy has essentially performed our randomization for us. The women in Arkansas who experienced the increase in benefits are the treatment group, and the women in Louisiana whose benefits did not change are the control group. Of course, where you live is in a coin flip. But as long as overall the women in both states are similar in their decisions to work, then this is just as good. In that case, we can just look at how much women in each state decide to work before and after the 2,000 benefits change in Arkansas. If women start working less in Arkansas compared to Louisiana after 2008 compared to before, then it suggests that the benefits change was causing less labor supply. Finally, no matter what methodology and data are used, it's important to interpret the findings. How do we relate the results of the study to the things we care about? In this case, for example, we might use our data from natural experiments to inform policymakers deciding on the level of government benefits and what groups to target. If these benefits cause individuals to stop working altogether, Oaken's bucket may be especially leaky and the cost of redistribution may be significant. On the other hand, if the benefits have little effect on individuals' work decisions, Perhaps the bucket's not as leaky as we feared. In fact, we've carried out studies like these for welfare benefits and labor supply. And the evidence says that reducing welfare benefits by a small amount doesn't much impact labor supply. But cutting them off entirely does induce certain type of individuals to work. This is the kind of evidence that helps policymakers as they consider the implications of changing the welfare system in the United States.